I'ma turn your ass like my kid. It's a big difference from a boy and a grown man. It's how you slap a nigga around with your whole hand. Bar for bar, you ain't got no chance. Leave the rap shit to me. Stick to the slow jam. Stick to the slow jams, nigga. <laughs> I mean, you can rap a little bit, but we just don't believe you. I mean, five, one, five, two, you be yelling at the top of your voice. And I just don't, I don't get the feeling, you know what I'm saying? Like, I listen to bars, I've been a street nigga my whole life. I I don't get that from you. I'm, maybe it's because you're from Canada, no disrespect to Canada, I don't know. But the, the gangster shit you preach it and the shit that I know, they don't really add up. There's a disconnect so. So keep making the melody songs, throw the oil tune on and all that shit. Shit cute, we gon' dance to it, my nigga. We lead the rapping shit to the rappers. Fact. This is a warm up. I know you ain't gon' see, you ain't gon' reply, you scared. You wanna rap against niggas that don't rap no more. You wanna battle Eminem. I guess. You wanna battle Eminem cause he probably ain't gonna battle you. Welcome, this is your girl, Sonya hudson Payne of Sonya On Air, and I am joined today by a very special guest that I've been trying to get in the building for about a couple of months, but the universe always finds a dynamic way to align yeah. itself, and the universe aligned itself tonight because I bring to you none other than my son. How are you? <laughs> well, thank, thank you, universe. Yeah, we always got to thank yourself. the universe. You got to thank the universe. You know, I'm blessed. And I'm highly favored, and thank you for having me. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. This is going to be sort of personal for me. I just really want to talk about the space that we're in as it relates to activism and where we're going. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to frame this conversation by sharing a personal story that I have with my daughter. So over the summer, we frequented a, a bar, a high-end bar restaurant at the One Hotel. Mm doesn't look like us the participants and I went with my daughter who is in her 20s and we were walking around and I saw someone following us and me being on my Brooklyn shit all day long I was just like oh he just trying to shoot a shot with me he kept following even when we went to the bar he asked the bartender okay what does she order so I'm still thinking I'm on my Brooklyn shit he probably wants to pay for my bottle of champagne about 20 minutes later I noticed that he was security following us so I looked at my daughter, who is one of the most disrespected people in the universe, the black woman, and I said, do you realize what just happened? And she didn't. And it sent me spiraling because as a black woman who was birthed out of a mother who integrated an all-white school, a grandmother who was a slave, um, I said, what did I do wrong? What was I not doing? Even though instead of beating her like we do in the black culture, I said, okay, every time you get in on punishment, I want you to read the autobiography of Malcolm X. I want you to look at this documentary right here. So I thought that I had all of my, my pigeons aligned, but that experience told me that I didn't. So I really want to talk to the people who are a part of our demographic, raising young kings and queens so that we know if we're doing everything right. Yes. So considering the space that you've come from as it relates to activism, how are you going to encourage the youth at this point in time so that it becomes a, de a definite part of their narrative, something so simple as, hey, brother, why didn't you get up when that queen got on the train to the point where why aren't we challenging um, school systems or the criminal justice system? So how can we encourage the youth so that it is a part of the definite narrative every single day? You can't. You, 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 <laughs> I'm not playing with you. I'm you, on my Brooklyn no, no, shit. No, no, you can't. You can't. You can't. <laughs> but um, that's my goal. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I realized that as, as a youth, I was taught wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I was raised to value things that really didn't have value. Right. Speak you on know, it. when I was young. W Unfortunately, what we glorified was negativity in the drug dealer. Yeah. You know, because that the drug dealer was the only thing in proximity to us that had some level of success. Yeah. You know, they had the girls we wanted, 
They had the cars we wanted. They the had clothes. the clothes we wanted. They had the respect. All those things. There wasn't no doctors that lived next door to us. There right. was no lawyers. There was none of these things that people talk about mm -hmm. that were in our community. Because all of those people that were, that made it to those places from our community left. Yeah. So we didn't have any visions of those things. We didn't. We didn't grow up in communities like the white people who had business owners and and construction owners who were lawyers and doctors and who were able to give them knowledge and say, oh, you want to be a doctor? All you got to do is this, this, and that. We're like, right. word? Is that easy? We had the drug dealer that just figured it out and told us, look, was trying to tell us no, but we followed his his footsteps anyway because right. he's like, no, nah, you ain't going to tell me no why you getting money. Right. We're going to figure out how to do what you do. We're going you, At some point, you're going to tell me because I'm going to figure it out on my own. It's right. like when you look at power, this is the reality of our community. Mm -hmm. The average drug dealer is trying to keep his kids and the, the kids away from that. But the kids are looking saying, no, nah, you can't tell me to get away. I'm watching how you own all these things, right. but you telling me not to do it. I don't, I, I have never seen anything else that's been successful that's close to me. Right. So when his son is telling him, I'm like you, ghost. He's, he, and, and, and that's what he dreads. He yeah. don't want his kids to be like him. Right. So when we look at that and we're telling our kids to do different, it has to change with us. Right. So when I decided that I was going to do something different, mm -hmm. I didn't do something different and leave my community. I did something exactly. different within my community. Right. I said that the, the objective is not to leave the community. The mm -hmm. objective is to fix the community. Right. And rebuild the community. Let the people that's from where you from see you as an example of what it is to do better. But just to capture that right there, because in the black community, we feel as if we've made it, if we can get something and leave the community, but not understanding how there's a form of reciprocity where we must circle back and pour into the community. But you also talked about our generation looking at drug dealers as the epitome of success. But now I'm finding that the youth are looking at these rappers who are popping mollies and are signing these lucrative deals and, you know, flossing on Instagram. And those are their go to people. So if we're just trying to redirect the optics of our youth where should they be looking the, the bottom line is it's very hard to redirect them because social media pretty much controls the yeah. world yeah. so if we're not utilizing the same platforms that they're utilizing because a lot of us from the communities that are doing positive things like i don't deal with that social media i'm, I'm in real life right but you have to utilize the platforms that they are utilizing to 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 misdirect our children, right, right. and I utilize and I and I deal with a lot of backlash because I talk about things that are not prevalent. They're not the most celebrated things. They're not the things that are highlighted, right. and and they strike a nerve because when you hear what I'm saying, it's like, damn, I don't, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. So for me to, to to pay attention to that, I have to address my own insufficiencies. Mm -hmm. I have to address what I'm not doing right. I have to say, damn, I have to question myself. And I don't mind taking that position because in order to re to you know to retrain and untrain our generation about what's going on, you have to be sacrificial. Right, you know what right. I'm saying? You have to say, you know what? I'm a, I'm gonna take these bullets. Right. You know, like even with the situation that happened with Jay Z and Kaepernick and people were like, Oh, Jay Z, you did this wrong or this and that. And what somebody said, T.I. had his, his podcast, and he was yeah. talking with, um, he was talking with um, Ice Cube, and who else was it? It was some LL Cool J. Mm -hmm. And he said, and Ice Cube and LL Cool J, you know what? When you do something first, you're going to take them bullets. Mm -hmm. It's like the zombies, right? When they're saying, some of them going to take these shots. Right. The first person in that door going to have to take these shots. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I'm going to have to be the sacrifice. I'm not going to get the praise mm -hmm. that the people that come behind me. It's just like what Malcolm X and, and Malcolm X, um, Martin Luther King did. They praised later in their death. But while mm -hmm. they was alive, you know, a, a lot of these activists are able to live and prosper and be financially stable and be celebrated because they were able to take shots, being called sellouts, being mm -hmm. called all these things right. because they understood the reality of what our people needed to do to be successful. Yeah. So I'm willing to sit there and say, okay, I know what I'm doing is not popular. Mm -hmm. I know me talking about 
staying in our communities and rebuilding our communities is something that these people won't tell them we crazy for right. because we need to fear our own people. They're, those are the people that's trying to kill us, but they're only trying to kill us and hurt us because they identify us with people who think they're better than them, that have more than them, not people that come into the hood and saying, look, we're going to figure this out. I know you're hungry. Let me figure out a way to make you make sure that you eat. Because mm -hmm. the average person comes back to the community to say, look, I got more than you. Mm. I got a Bentley, you don't have one. Right. I'm living in Beverly Hills, you don't have one. I got my chain and say, look, celebrate me. Mm -hmm. But you, see, see, I tell people all the time, the crab in the barrel syndrome it's real. was created by the crab out the barrel. Mm. <laughs> Cause when the crab out, when the crabs in the barrel realize the crab that's out the barrel ain't coming back with no ladder, he ain't gonna put his claw in and pull you out. Mm -hmm. Why should I be happy that you got out the barrel? Right, right. Just think about it. If we all in the barrel trying to get out, I'm I'm gonna pull you down because I'm trying to get out too. But if you, if I thought, if I know that when you get out, you come back to get us, you come back with a ladder, you gonna put your claw, you gonna get everybody else to get us out. I'm gonna celebrate you. The average person that gets out the barrel mm -hmm. just wants to say, nah, 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 nah. I'm out the barrel and you not. Right. Why should I be happy for you? So do you find that that's still true for our of culture? Of course it is for our culture. Yeah. That's what we celebrate. We celebrate the artists in the community that tell you. I'm, I got millions of dollars and you broke. Yeah. The, the, the songs is braggadocio. Mm -hmm. Look, I got this. You ain't got nothing. You niggas is broke. I don't need to care about you. Right. Why? Why? Why would I want to put in the face of people that's starving that I'm I'm eating way more than anybody else is eating? True. If I'm not bringing nothing back, right. if I, because my thing is when I left the hood, it's like okay, I'm leaving, but I'm coming back with something that we can all eat, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna come back with a plan that we can all eat. Mm -hmm. How, why should I expect you to be happy for me right. when you don't have nothing still, and I got a bunch? Well, can we change that expectation and expect people to be happy for us if we come back to the community and say, listen, I'm eating and I want to show you how to eat too? Can we celebrate? That makes sense. But the bottom line is you can't. I'm, you know why people like DMX was able to go back to the community? Because he never, he never bragged and said, I got more than you. True. You knew that he was selling True. five million and three million. True. But he was able, I was on tour with DMX. When he first started, like he used to take me, plays with him, and I used to watch him and just be in amazement. Mm -hmm. And I used to watch him, wherever he went, he said, I want to go to the hood. I don't want to go to none of this shit. Tell me where the hood is here. Right, right. And they like, no, you can't. And he's like, listen, I don't need no security, nothing. Mm -hmm. Put me in the middle of the hood and watch me do what I do. And they're going to love me because I'm so authentic. I've never told them I got more than you and you stupid because right. you ain't got more than me. Yeah, but you know, I understand that. But sometimes it can be sort of a, a curse. Let's talk about Nipsey Hussle, who, you know, he was a person who was for the community, stayed in his community, wanted to be a blueprint for the community, and the community killed him. But when you think about Nipsey Hussle, right, and and you try to find, like DMX says, to live is to suffer, mm. and to survive is to find a meaning in the suffering, right? Mm. When you look at Nipsey Hussle's life after death, mm. Right? A life of its own. When Nipsey Hussle was here, they didn't even appreciate him. Right. In a manner. People didn't even understand that that many people even identified who he was and what it is that he represented. Mm -hmm. When he lost his life, because God don't make mistakes. Right. I believe that. When he lost his life, he was immortalized yeah. to a point that people had to pay attention and look at what it is he represented. Mm -hmm. It was kids like, I didn't even know who Nipsey was, but when this happened, let me go look him up. And they, they listened to the lessons that he had. Right. And they started to live their lives by the lessons that this man had mm -hmm. in life that nobody was paying attention yeah. to while he was alive. Mm -hmm. I was one of the few, not saying few, there was a bunch of people that loved Nip. But before I met Nip, I was like, this man's on the same frequency. I don't right, know. Right. You know, and fortunately for me, we was able to meet in the summer before he passed, and mm -hmm. we did a concert together in which he was the headliner, and I was one of the performers on that concert. Mm -hmm. And I was able to, <gasps> excuse me, interview him, and we sat backstage, and he looked at me and was like, yo, I love what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I see what you're doing. And we had a real conversation. He gave me his number, like, whatever you need from me. And we were able to build because it was like-minded mm -hmm. to where when I found out that Nipsey lost his life, I was on my way 
to my brother, um, Wad Dean, who is one of the founders of Rough Riders. Mm -hmm. And I was on my way to his birthday party. And my wife called me and was like, yo, you heard what happened to Nipsey? I'm like, what you mean we're having Nipsey? And I had just sent him a song that we were supposed to do. He's like, yo, he sent me his email and just send it to me. And my wife told me, like, Nipsey lost his life. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. I, I started crying. I was on Instagram talking like, you. how do we let this happen? I was crying. I was in tears. I was in a club. This ain't something I knew, normally did, but I was so emotional right. about Nipsey losing his life that I, I couldn't even control it. And it Same wasn't man. like somebody that I knew every day, mm -hmm. but the, the connection and the meeting that we had was so potent right. and it was so elaborate. It was so, you know, you know, it was so meaningful to me in understanding what he represented and mm -hmm. that he was one like me. Right. You know what I'm saying? That it, it touched me that way. And I think that, unfortunately, you know, if he hadn't lost his life, the impact that he had on this world wouldn't have been the same. I know. And God utilized him for his thir 33 years, mm -hmm. the same amount of years that Jesus lived on this earth, to make a statement, mm -hmm. to empower, to motivate, to to push us in a direction that we probably would have never went on. So his sure. sac the way his life was set up was exactly the way How God it was supposed to be. meant it to be. So you you talked about a lot of things. I just want to kind of sum this up. You know, things that really resonated with me. And we framed this entire conversation about connecting. You know, our demographic to this. You know, new mm -hmm. uh, generation. And you mentioned we mentioned Nipsey Hussle. You mentioned Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. But you also met a very important influential person who ties. Us all together, Minister Farrakhan. Ooh. So let's just talk about and meeting him. How was he able to order your steps so that you can further pour into the culture that we call hip hop? Listen, um, I'm just gonna be honest, man. When you when you um, Farrakhan is a li it's pretty much like a living deity. Yeah, it's not like when you in the presence of Farrakhan, you you realize this man is anointed. It ain't. Nothing that you got to think about. You realize that God put him here for a purpose. Don't, mm -hmm. and, and you look at Jesus Christ, how he was hung for being authentic. Like, mm -hmm. we, 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 we have a whole religion based on someone who was hung. And in and, and the same way they try to frame Farrakhan is the same way they frame Jesus Christ. And yeah. it, it, there's no, you know, no, no mystery of why it is. Farrakhan has spoke life into so many people when you look at what he's done to our communities when you look at what he's meant for people when he has transformed people who were on a, a road to nothing but destruction i've met, i've personally met people who he's transformed their lives from something that was nothing to where they are entrepreneurs yeah. to where they have fruitful lives to where they've changed their things so you can't tell me nothing about farrakhan right. i've sat in a room with farrakhan where he looked me in my eyes mm -hmm. And he inspired me like nobody has ever inspired me. It's no negativity. It's no hate. What they try to tell you, he's never tried to in, 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 instill hate in anyone. Mm -hmm. He has nothing but love. But he has identified the struggles that black people have identified with in this country since we've got here. Mm -hmm. And he empowered us and told us what we need to do to be better as human beings. I love it. And sitting in that room and listening to him talk and the love in which he speaks to, the tone in which he speaks in, is just so, it's like, damn, yeah. I, got, I got to be a better person. Right. When, when somebody, and he's looked at me and said, look, you have a job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember I did a song for him, you know, that never made his album. It was supposed to be, this song that um, Snoop Dogg and Rick Ross only people, and he told me to do the song, and I was mad. Mm. And I didn't make the song, and he took my verse off, and he put Rick Ross, and I was like, yo, I did this verse. He told me he loved the verse. Never knew that. And he Never took it off. And I, was, and, I had, and I was feeling such a I'm like, damn, mm. I did this, and you told me it was dope, and he's like, whatever. And then I did this, one of the Funk Master Flex freestyles, the last one I did. I heard that. And he got my brother Don Enoch, who's a, like, one of his right hand brothers to call me and told me how impressed in which he got he said the minister wants to talk to you about this verse and he said wow. brother called you to the road called me and said brother what you said on that verse was oh my god 
it yeah. was phenomenal. It was right. it was what God God put that in you. And I know he said, I know you mad about that. And I get it. Mm -hmm. But this was this is what God put you here for. And I had to and even though I was frustrated about me not being on that verse, because I had told everybody I'm gonna be on the Minister right. Farrakhan's album. Right. right. And when I when it wasn't there, I was disappointed. But even it, even in my disappointment, what he means to me it's is so just much so more. much more, yeah. you know, yeah. and he inspired me to be, you know, a better version of me, mm -hmm. you know, and live in my authenticity despite what he said. Yo, look, I remember he told me somebody looked and he said something about somebody mm -hmm. and they came up to him and he pointed a gun at him and he looked at him. And they said, what did you say, Farrakhan? He said, he looked him in his eyes and said, that's exactly what I said. <laughs> I love it. And he said, when I looked that man in his eyes, the fear, whatever I had in me, I said, this is who I have to be. Right. And, 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 and they didn't pull the trigger. He said, if you look the devil in his eyes mm -hmm. and you stand strong, they will retreat. True. And he said, he was pointing the gun and said, Farrakhan, you said this. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's exactly what I said, brother. So I want you to say exactly one thing. The culmination of who you are today, considering all that you have gone through, in one word, who is that individual? Authenticity. I love it. Well, there you have it. Authenticity with my son. Thank you so much for sharing this space and being totally transparent and unapologetically bold. Give me a five. Good. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for having me. No problem.